Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker, Fred Lee. So good. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you for this honor. And thank you, Tom, for the nice introduction. Of course, I live right here in Orlando and uh, worked at Florida Hospital, which a lot of people call the Disney Hospital. But my background is not Disney, it is healthcare. My wife was the, well I say was because she's retired now, but was the director of nurses for one of the Florida Hospital branches here in town. Now the topic I've chosen for today, of course an entire book to be squeezed down into a few bullet points is not easy. But at least I want to talk about how do we go from good to great in patient perceptions. And I want to be, pure, cure, want to be sure that we understand that the word patient satisfaction is not used here because it would be too redundant. Good to great, if you think of good to great on a spectrum, you can't use satisfaction because satisfaction is one data point on a spectrum that goes all the way from we love you to we hate you. And if you are dedicated to patient satisfaction, you'll probably get what you're dedicated to, which in our definition this morning is good. <laughs> but it's not necessarily great. And that's where I'd like to talk. But how would Disney fit into this? I know that we all think of Disney as all about fun, and we can have some fun, I suppose, showing some Disney stuff in our lobbies or uh, wearing a Disney hat or something to entertain children, but that's not where I am interested in going this morning. When I worked at Disney for a little while as a consultant for them in preparing a program called Disney's Approach to Quality Service for the Healthcare Industry, and I was the industry representative on that team, it didn't feel like the principles of, that we were teaching really fit healthcare to a T. And then I read a book called The Experience Economy in which two economists used Disney as the primary example of what they were trying to promote to other economists, and that is instead of three sectors of the economy, commodities, goods, and services, there's really four. And the fourth is as big as the others and completely different. Now, if there's only these three sectors, where is healthcare? Well, it's not manufacturing and it's not commodities, so it leaves us in the service industry. So of course this intrigued me because is there a different sector that might apply to us more than the service sector? When we were working on a program called Disney's Approach to Quality Service, clearly a service focus. Well this opened my eyes and became the basis for my book which has a different approach and had changed my paradigm when I read it. You don't come out of a movie talking about the service you got. And you don't say to somebody, what kind of service did you get at that Broadway play? It doesn't make any sense. It is something completely different. And they call that an experience. When the what is happening is essentially happening inside of you and it has an emotional impact on you, then that is different than a service which happens outside of you. It's labor done for you you would otherwise have to do for yourself. Wash your car, wash your windows, mow your lawn, do your laundry. That's labor performed as a service with a smile. But a movie or a play is highly emotional. And then notice Disney's mission statement that I'm going to put up on the screen. And I'm pausing because this is not going to fit our industry. That's what makes it a difficult connection for people because Walt Disney's mission statement is we deliver fun and happiness for the whole family. Now imagine me using this mission statement with a bunch of nurse managers. 
It's a little bit difficult. And that was what we were trying to do in our Disney program. But this opened my eyes. The category that these authors put Disneyland and all the movies at Disney was not in the service industry. Disney is in manufacturing. They make toys. They make clothes. They make a parable. They are in the service business. They have timeshares. They run, run restaurants. They have hotels. But we're talking now the experience side, which is their movies, Broadway plays, and those kinds of things. Tom Hanks, for instance, Entertainment business, theater. What movie when he was the voice of Woody? Anybody know? Toy Story. <laughs> Entertaining. But if you wanted to make a movie of Tom Hanks dying of AIDS, what movie? Philadelphia. You wouldn't take that script to Disney, even though you're still in theater, you're still in the same sector, you're still talking about something emotional that you are producing, but theater is about the drama of things that make us laugh as well as the drama of things that make us cry. And so if you wanted to make a tragedy, you wouldn't go to Disney. They would say, do you see our mission statement? A tragedy? You would have to go to another director for that. So with that notion, we could say that we are in the same sector, the experience sector, where people's emotional needs are as almost as critical sometimes as their physical needs. So we're in that sector, but we're quite different because Disney is on the comedy end, meeting the emotional needs of a family to have fun together. And in healthcare, of course, we're meeting the emotional needs more often of a family going through fear, pain, anxiety, and even tragedy together. And that's the distinction that made a lot of sense to me. So even though today I'm wearing this pin, and I knew that in an audience somebody would wonder, what is that white thing on his, you know, he needs to knock that, <laughs> you can know, well, you can see it up there, I guess. And what do I like about this pin? That it goes where I would like to go. I would like to say that there is a balance in, emo in people's needs between their physical needs and their emotional needs. And of course, the ears on this pin remind us, don't forget to have fun. But the primary message of this pin is not so much about fun as it is about meeting people's needs both emotional and physical. If we go with that, then we're going to talk about the emotional side. I'm not a physician, so I'm not going to talk about the, the physical needs and clinical needs. But I can talk about patient perceptions. I have a son who's juvenile diabetes. I've had uh, my first wife died of encephalitis when she was 28, ling lingering with a long illness in the hospital. So I feel like patient perceptions is an area I can certainly speak for. Here's some thoughts I would like you to grasp. Number one, satisfied patients have no story to tell. Only the very satisfied and the dissatisfied have a story to tell. So let's start with that premise. So if you want to go from good to great, you would have to create an experience that somebody is willing and desiring to talk about. So number two, don't have a story to tell and can't tell us how to improve their experience because if they have no complaints, how can they tell you to improve? We need to stop asking people, how could we have improved your experience unless they're upset or unless they love us? And then the question is, well, what made you love us so much? Those are the only two groups we can learn from because only fans are promoters. Only promoters correlate with financial performance and market share because they help build the reputation of what it's like to go to that doctor's office. And then finally, what makes a fan? Well, the best place to find out is in your fan mail. I asked my wife, the director of nurses at a 
three or 300 bed hospital, could you bring home your fan mail? I want to go through the fan mail and pick the words that a fan uses who comes into the hospital. I didn't do this in a pediatric office, but the logic is the same. Go to your fan mail to find what makes a fan. Now her fan mail gave me these words. I arranged them by the words used most often to the least often, caring, cared, and cares. 35 times, those three variations times 32, 32 more, the word caring. The second word was kind and kindness. But that's not a second variable, it's the same thing. Two variables would be like me saying, were we quick and nice? You can be nice and not quick, you can be quick and not nice, that's two variables. You need two questions. But if I said to you, were we kind and caring, you would not say that needs to be two questions. You would understand that as synonyms for the same variable. And compassion is one more synonym. Were we kind, caring, and compassionate would not confuse anyone. Help and helpfulness is how I know you're kind. Comfort and comforting is how I know you have compassion. And I don't believe we get to a second variable in this, dis in this distinction about what makes a fan until we hit friendly. Because you can be friendly and not particularly helpful or compassionate. I see you know people like that. <laughs> so this circle, the one gigantic variable we like to talk about the vital few that make the biggest difference. How about the vital one? I don't think we, I think we have another, another variable when we hit professional. Because I know you can be professional and not friendly. And I hate to say it, but you can be professional and not friendly or compassionate. And I know people like that. Now, if you go to the service industry, will they teach you anything about compassion, caring, comforting, empathy? No. They are in the business of courtesy with a smile. So if we think we can go from good to great by simple courtesy, we'll never get a fan mail. The word courtesy is at the bottom of this list, which means luckily I got it once and it was attached to a word like compassion. <laughs> they were courteous and compassionate, like that's a surprise. Why should I write you a fan mail if all you did was do what I expect him to do at Burger King? How did that make you great? With that in mind, those words are not on anybody's survey, so if you don't, if you if a patient satisfaction survey, then that's what you ought to call it, but it will not take you from good to great because satisfaction is good and great is something else. If none of those words are on a survey. Do you know why they're not on any survey, not the age caps or anything else? Because you can't measure objectively compassion. You can say, did you smile? Did you greet the patient? Did you use the patient's name? Did you explain what the medications were for? Did you explain the side effects? That's a checklist. But how do you measure something like compassion? In fact, Deming said the most important thing for anybody's business can't be measured. And he's talking about this kind of what makes a fan. Just because you can't measure it doesn't mean we don't have evidence, scientifically based evidence for things we don't measure. Story. When I was about 10 years old, we were living in Taiwan. My parents were missionaries. And I saved a dog that was being stoned by other boys and girls in the street. I brought this mangy dog home. My mother was aghast, but glad her son was kind enough to rescue a dog in spite of everybody throwing stones at it. So we tried to nurse this dog only to find out it had rabies. 
So I had to go through these 14 days back in the 50s, and I don't know if they've changed anything about what they give you for rabies anymore, but it's 14 days of the most painful shots. And I remember after the doctor gave me my first shot, which made me cry, the next day I had to go back, and on the way to the doctor's office, I was telling my mother, please ask him if you could give my shot. And she says, the doctor gives a shot. Well, it hurts so much. Well, it's the same shot. I know, Mom, please. Will you please? And I just begged her to let the doctor give me a shot. My, wife, my mother was a nurse. She'd given me all the shots in my life practically up until then. And when she went into the doctor's office, she said, he's begging me if I could give the shot. I'm a nurse to you, Mom. And the doctor said, no, go ahead. That shot did not hurt near as much when my mother gave it. And I wanted her to give all my shots after that as long as I was with her anyway. I would always say, could my mother <laughs> give me my shot? You see, now looking back, I realized that my mother giving the shot was actually a placebo effect on my perception of pain. The kindness, the caring, the compassion of a mother. I wince, she winces. I say, ah, she slows down a little bit of the medication. You know, yeah, that's better, mother. You know, it's just like with this connection of empathy with a parent made all the difference in the world. You know, I was looking for my clock. Do I see a clock? Oh, well. <laughs> I get a little carried away here. So that's my mom's story. And then I read not long ago a study of physician empathy and the common cold clinical trial published in Family Medicine Journal in 2009. And here was the data. This is the synopsis. For patients with the common cold, that gets about as common as you can get, physician empathy. Not nurse empathy, physician empathy in the office. In just one visit at the beginning is a significant predictor of duration, severity, improved immune function. How do you know it improved the immune function? Because they did a swab within the first 48 hours after the doctor's visit, measuring the interleukin-8 levels, which is known to fight colds. You wonder, how did they do that? Here's a little more of the information. Two clinics in Wisconsin, randomized control, 350 subjects. Never seen these doctors before, not any regular patients, not affiliated with the clinics. Standard versus an enhanced or empathetic physician visit. Same visit, knew how to do two kinds of examinations. One was clinical, and one was this enhanced with empathy. So the doctor, half his patients did one way and half his patients did the other, so you didn't have any distortion by the fact, well, some people just like that doctor more. We're talking every doctor doing two different kinds. They did both a standard and an enhanced round. Notice that an acting coach is what they use, which I tell people to use in their, my book because I know that you can fake it, but most people know it. And acting teaches you not to fake, how to think thoughts in such a way through imagination that you actually feel the empathy. Because when you truly feel empathetic, then all the subconscious cues pick up on that, and most people can tell when you're feigning empathy uh, by just using the words. Patient answered a test question on validity of care, these care questions, symptoms we reported twice a day, and so on. I'll end with this thought. Harry A. Wilmer established the Department of Psychiatrists at Stanford University and made this statement, the failure to empathize is the basis of most of the unhappy patient-doctor relationships. And I would like to say, through empathy, the patient-family relationship with the doctor is enhanced and all you need to do is look at your fan mail and tell me if I'm right or wrong. Thank you all very much. <laughs>